Okay, how's everybody, how's everybody doing today? Good. All right. So, my name is Rohan, uh, and today I'll be talking, I'll be presenting my talk, Fighting the Flu with Machine Learning. So, the, oh, there are, is my Twitter handle and my GitHub. If you didn't catch that, it'll be on the last slide. So, when I'm taking questions, you can look at it. So, I am going to be an 11th grader this fall in high school. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. So I've been programming for two years now, uh, mostly in Python. I've also done a little bit of Java and R, and I'm not very proud of the Java part because I did start with Java, and that gave me a terrible introduction to programming. So yeah, I've, after I started Python, I was like, this is way cooler. So I'm doing Python now, and specifically, I like scientific programming and data analytics and machine learning, stuff like that. So today I'll be talking, and I like doing projects. So today I'll be talking about one such project. So let's, let, me st let me start with the problem, is the flu. So chances are you may or may not have had the flu before. So uh, millions are affected worldwide, and there currently there isn't a great way for scientists to make vaccines for the flu. So they just vote on what drugs and antibody should go into the flu vaccine for that year. And this practice has been called questionable by the National Institutes of Medicine. So, and um, sometimes the vaccines don't always work. If you remember in 2009, there was a worldwide pandemic of the H1N1 flu virus. So what I wanted to do in this project was create a better way for scientists to come up with vaccines and my Solution to that was to come up to predict how flu strains would look like in the coming year so that scientists could analyze that and then have specific vaccines tailored towards them, tailored towards those specific flu strains so you'd have a lower probability of getting sick. So here is a nice graphic of how the flu infects a host. So in that first panel, you've got the virus, which is the, small, the smaller uh, circle and the cell. So those little purple dots on the outside of the virus, those are, called, those, are called, those are proteins, and they attach to the receptors on the host cell. So, and then after the virus gets in the cell, it dies, and it injects its viral DNA and RNA and its other genetic material. And as the cell grows, so, so do that DNA, RNA, and those proteins. And eventually, at, when the cell is about to die, all those viruses leave the cell, and they infect and they go on to infect other cells. So from this, from this, uh, from this research, I, des to more so I decided to look at those specific proteins, those little purple dots on the outside of the cell. Uh, in the flu, those are called hemagglutinin and neuraminidase, and being biologists, they had to come up with extra long names for them. So, so um, for now, we'll just refer to them as HA and NA. So, HA regulates whether the virus can enter the cell or not, and NA uh, regulates whether that cell can, whether the virus can leave the cell. So I thought to myself, if I could knock those proteins out or come up with some, or predict how they would look in the future, then scientists can create vaccines which could take out those uh, proteins and thus in, uh, prohibit the cell from, and prohibit the virus from entering the cell. So this is my approach. So I would first predict future genetic sequences of the flu, and scientists could analyze that, and I would, use, and I would do that using phylogenetics and machine learning. So phylogenetics is a, study of, uh, is a study of the relationships between individuals on an evolutionary tree. So this is pretty much a phylogenetic tree. You've probably seen one of these. So, so right there on the bottom, you have uh, E, which is the child of F. And F. so what I would do is I would say, hmm, how, ha how has the genetic sequence of E changed from F? And how the genetic sequence of F has changed from G? So, I, so if I could train a machine learning model to analyze these relationships, as the flu changes generation by generation, then maybe I could predict like maybe a child of E. 
a child of E, maybe what, what would that look like? Maybe would it be AACC? Would it be AATC? So I wanted to figure that out. So my setup was to first obtain data from the Influenza Research Database, or IRDB, which is funded by the National Institutes of Health, and read in the genetic sequences of hemagglutinin and uraminidase, and train a machine learning model based on the phylogenetic relationship. So what I wanted to do was train the relationships between G, F, and E. So how has F changed from G, and how has E changed from F? But uh, me being inexperienced as I am, I wasn't sure how a homemade machine learning model would work because the flu data is quite complex and I wasn't sure if my homemade algorithm could match that level of complexity and predict as well. I, wasn't, I also wasn't sure what machine learning model to use, uh, how to measure accuracy, and how to read in a FASTA file, which is a common file format for biological data. So this is where my first library came to my rescue, and that was BioPython. So BioPython deals with and everything, everything bio, biology in Python. So, uh, what I so I use this library to get past that initial hurdle. Initial hurdle of how to read in a FASTA file. Originally, I was reading it in as a regular TXT, and that wasn't working out very well because I had, when you read it in as a TXT, there's there, are, it just there are a bunch of like random characters that in, are in a FASTA file which show up. So. What I, what I was looking, what I used to do was look for patterns, uh, look for specific characters which show up right before the, the gene sequence actually shows up, and that wasn't working out very well. So with, a, with BioPython, I was able to read in a FASTA file much more easily. So after I got past that hurdle, it was time to create the algorithm myself. So I did some research and I found a decision tree, a decision tree algorithm would be the best fit because it was easy for me to write and it, it, was e it would be easy for me to debug. And as well, it matches a phylogenetic tree as every time a decision tree branches, it, it's similar to how a phylogenetic tree branches from, from its parent to the children and as a decision tree branches from one question to more questions or a decision. But there are lots of problems. So I, I wrote a classification algorithm, although I what I really wanted was a regression algorithm. As the algorithm was too simple and it underfit the data. So my initial hypothesis was, was confirmed because I could not write an algorithm that matched the level of complexity that the flu data had. So scikit-learn helped me. As you probably, most of you know, scikit-learn is the go-to machine learning uh, library for Python. And with this, I was able to use lots of algorithms. I could just import them really easily. I didn't have to write them myself, so that saved a lot of time. Um, so now with BioPython and scikit-learn by my side, uh, this, is the, this is my setup, which is updated to reflect the change the changes that I made. So the first step stays the same. I still get the data from the Influenza Research Database. Um, next, I would read in the I would I would read in the flu genetic sequences using BioPython, and I'll show you how easy it was for me to for me to get that data really to get that data using BioPython. And I had to add another step, which is encoding the data. So with Scikit-Learn. Or, or rather, with my previous algorithm, I would simply input uh, the, eight, the genetic sequence, which is a big string, like roughly 1,700 letters long, ATGC, just, combi just random combinations of those four letters. And I could just input that directly into uh, my flu prediction algorithm. However, with scikit-learn, it only takes numerical input. So I had to encode those uh, genetic those letters into numbers. So I had to add that step. And the last step stayed pretty much the same with the exception that instead of writing my own algorithm, I would use the scikit-learn library. So here's, this is a diagram that I drew um, showing you the, al the overview of everything I would do. So what I would do was create a phylo phylogenetic tree for each protein. So pretty much the grandparent to parent grandparent to parent to child relationships between uh, 
between flu strains. Next, I would encode the data, and then after that, I would give the data to my scikit-learn algorithm and test the accuracy using cross-validation, and then add more data and this, and just continue doing this until I reached a favorable result. So, this is what I could do with BioPython. In just one line, I could, I could re, I, I could get the, the data which is stored in in that, uh, in HA100, which is 100 FASTA files. And by doing by doing that, that this by turn, putting them into a list, I had I had one big list of all the different FASTA files. So what it would be would be. Uh, a grandparent, a parent, and a child, and then a group of three, and then another grandparent, parent, child, and so on for a hundred of these. So instead of looking for specific characters which signal the beginning of a genetic sequence, I could, I could use, I could write in one line, I, and I could have all of, the, all of the relationships ready. So this was my encoding method. So essentially what I did was for A, a corresponded to one, T corresponded to two, and so on. So what I, what I would do was I would take these huge uh, strings of A, T, G, Gs, and Cs and convert them into one big number. So what I did initially was, what I did initially was take these, all of these letters and put them in one big int of 1,700 digits. And I soon found out that only five of them that were being stored. So I tried putting them in a float. That worked a bit better. However, it could only store up to 15 digits. So what I ended up doing, and what, what I ended up doing was uh, breaking them up into floats of 15, and then putting each float of 15 digits into one big list with roughly 80 elements. So I would have one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four up to 15 then another element in the list with more digits and so on for roughly 80 elements. And that would be the entire genetic, se genetic sequence of the HA protein. And this was my, this was my, my uh, decision, decision tree algorithm before scikit-learn, and this was my decision tree algorithm after. <laughs> so this is, and this is not even the whole thing. This is like half of it. So pretty much, from 80 something lines to six. So that, that was incredible. I was, I was blown away. Like how can, how, for, for me, I've never, I've never seen this before. So I was really excited and it turns out this had really good accuracy as well. But there were some drawbacks uh, in using uh, BioPython and scikit-learn. BioPython not as much, but uh, with scikit-learn, uh, I was, I could, I was, only, I was, uh, I had to stick with training my uh, machine learning model on simply the parent to child relationships because you, in scikit-learn, you don't have that, I couldn't add that extra generation of that grandparent, which I would like to add because you know, more data always results in a better model. You can't, you can't beat more data. So I could only go one generate, like one correlation. So I could only go from parent to child. And scikit-learn also couldn't, uh, take letters or characters, and I, I wish that I could have put all of those, uh, base, those base pairs, those ATGC, into one big int, uh, so I wish it could hold more significant digits, but uh, you can only get so much. So now I'll talk about my results. So uh, this is H1N1. So H1N1 is a subtype of the flu. There are lots of different subtypes. Um, so I trained mine on the most common ones which infect humans because I want to protect humans. So, <laughs> so H1N1 is, you, this, was, this was the one that broke out in 2009. Uh, it caused a glo global pandemic resulting in a lot of deaths. It was actually the most potent flu since uh, the Spanish flu in all the way back in 1918. So this one is especially dangerous because it mutates very often, and although this does not affect humans that much, thankfully, but it still mutates really quickly, and that makes it really dangerous. And this is another flu subtype called H3N2. This is more common in humans and doesn't mutate as quickly. So uh, you probably noticed that uh, the accuracies with these three, uh, 
with these three algorithms, decision trees, random forests, and extra trees, uh, they performed a lot better in H3N2. Uh, and I think this is because H3N2 doesn't mutate as much, so it's easier for the algorithm to pick up on those uh, changes because there's not as many. So uh, this is H3N2 and this is H1N1. And those two, those, those two bars, the yellow is the, neuromi the neuraminidase, which regulates the exit, and the blue bar is the hemagglutinin, which uh, regulates the entry of the cell. So uh, with the exception of the decision tree algorithm and extra tree algorithm, uh, the, my model performed really well. So I ended up going with the random forest algorithm. Uh, and these, these three are all decision-based, decision tree-based. So I compared my, uh, my uh, algorithm with two previous uh, European studies. So uh, this one right here is a German study and this one is a study done in Spain, I believe. So both of these do not use machine learning. Rather, they just rely on formulas to predict uh, how the flu will change in the coming years. And as you can see, uh, the results look very encouraging. So uh, to sum it all up, I wanted to create a better way for uh, scientists to make uh, vaccines for the flu. And, by, and uh, so how I went about doing that was to pr predict how the flu would change in the coming year so that scientists could create vaccines specifically tailored towards them. Um, I used BioPython and scikit-learn to, to make my um, to make my algorithm shorter, as you saw in the, uh, psych how scikit-learn helped me, and the results look very encouraging. So thank you all very much. <laughs> so yeah, I just feel I'm taking questions right now. So anybody? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, they, they code for the amino acids, but what like what I decided to do was if you can take out the the sequences that are coding for those amino acids, like take out like if you can if you can um, create a antibody which can perhaps change one of those sequences, like. Um, I'm diving really deep into biology here, but um, so I believe UTA is, this, is the codon, which is that three, uh, three base pair long sequence to stop coding for any more acid, uh, for any more protein. So if you can maybe create an antibody which would change, uh, which would perhaps move that little like uh, codon uh, for, uh, in, in the beginning, then you can stop that hemagglutinin from being coded, so it won't be able to enter the cell. So I just, so I was just predicting that. Yeah. Anybody? Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, sure. Oh yeah, congratulations! That was a great talk. Um, were you able to communicate your results to any no, research? No, I haven't done that yet. That's definitely I'm going to do that this summer because. I was, this was for a science fair in my uh, community. So uh, I w after that, I was, you know, I'm a high schooler. So it's <laughs> lo lots, of, lots of APs coming up. But now it's summer, now it's summer. So I think that's definitely on my to-do list before school starts is communicate my results to scientists. Definitely send out, sending out some emails. Yeah. You said you were encoding um, a set of base pairs as numbers and storing yeah. them as long floats in mm -hmm. a list, right? So why not store them each as codons instead of a set of fifteen? That's actually a good. That's actually a good question. Like I could, I could actually do it that way. I think I'll definitely try storing them as individual codons so that sci scientists can like, like see where each one is occurring. Like, mm, how do I? Yeah, I mean, I could, I could, I could definitely uh, try it like that. Any other questions? Uh, 
Yeah, all right. Thank you very much.